Welcome. Uh, glad that uh, that you could be here this uh, well, it's afternoon. Um, you know, it's my pleasure uh, on behalf of uh, geologist at Jackson Hole and the Senior Center to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Saman Aryana. And I mean, many of you were there last night. So I'll, I'll make this brief. He's a member of the faculty at the Chemical Engineering, the University of Wyoming, bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Texas Arlington, uh, PhD in Energy Resources Engineering from, uh, from Stanford. Uh, he's been at the University of Wyoming for five years. Um, loves it, at least mostly, most of the time, <laughs> I think. Uh, and his, his wife is also a faculty member at the University of Wyoming. Wyoming. So you know, we're really fortunate to have uh, Dr. Ayana here to speak with us, to follow on from his presentation last night. And I'm going to turn the floor over, and he doesn't have to sit here like this. The, screen, the uh, camera is going to be focused on the screen. So, Saman, uh, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. So, any any uh, uh, questions you have, please feel free to stop me at any point during this. This is not too terribly different from if you were there yesterday. It's very similar to what we saw yesterday. Um, the context that we were talking about, so we're talking about microfluidics and porous media, and the context is the subsurface, geological formations, and there's a kind of a belt of different applications that uh, this is concerned with, carbon capture and geological storage, CO2 sequestration and storage, geothermal, oil and gas, petroleum, and also hydrogeology, near surface, groundwater, aquifers, even recovery of uranium, sometimes they do water flooding in certain formations that have a certain amount of uranium, and so that's also sometimes a flow to porous media type of a question. The common thread between the kinds of work that I do is the question of scale. I think about various problems related to flow through porous media uh, across a range of scales, starting from the very large scale, field scale, where we're talking about miles or kilometers, the entirety of the system, all the way down to very small scale. So for instance, in shale, we're talking about pores that are nanoscale, a billionth of a meter, very, very small. And sometimes we need to be, when we have these guys present, we have to understand the physics in these small scale features and then be able to upscale that information and think about larger scale features, pores that are in the range of microns, micrometer features, and then think about what information gets carried up the scale, up the ladder of scale to uh, thinking about how a chunk of rock might behave and then take that information further up to the entirety of the system. So the way I think about this, um, perhaps, um, you know, I wonder in Pentagon, for instance, if they're doing modeling for war games, if they're thinking about a, an army of some sort, how do they do the modeling? You know, do they think about individual soldiers? You know, if you have an army with 100,000 soldiers, it might be hard to account for every individual person. So they might think of units and try to capture the statistics some kind of property of the average soldier in each unit and then bring that information up the skill, up the ladder of skills so that they can say something about the entire army of a foreign country. So this is kind of what this is. We're, we're not talking about, we're not going to think about every single nanoscale feature when we're thinking about the entirety of the system. But we need to understand the physics that dominate the behavior of the system at various scales and have a way to capture that behavior at the large scale so we can describe systems that matter to us. Matter to us because, especially in Wyoming, we have a lot of applications related to this. Our economy is tied to extraction, mineral resources. We don't have a state income tax, and that's in large part due to taxation of uh, resources tied to the subsurface. Now, in terms of the work I do, there's a bit of modeling, where we do math modeling and then numerics to try to develop predictive physics-based models of the subsurface. And to um, motivate some of these models, we also do experiments. I have a microfluidics lab. I direct a microfluidics lab at the University of Wyoming, where we make devices that in our mind, we present the subsurface, we come up with different designs, different systems, flow different fluids through 
the media that we create take images, analyze the images to say something about what we can expect to see in the subsurface. My introduction to experimentation related to porous media was through tomography systems. So this is a medical CT scanner. This is through my graduate work, um, where the, a uh, sandstone core was potted inside a uh, aluminum core holder. And this setup was ultimately placed inside the field of view of a CT scanner. There are multiple access points on top of this, so we can collect samples or be able to uh, monitor uh, the pressure along the core. Then we'd inject things from the inlet, this side, and then things would come up from the other side. We designed the system such that they would address questions that we were interested in. The information that the CT would provide essentially is tied to the attenuation of x-ray that goes through the medium. If the uh, content in a particular point of the medium is denser, the attenuation is higher, and that's related to the number, the value that appears for that particular position in space. It's a three-dimensional kind of an idea, so similar to a picture that you take. In a digital picture, it's got pixels. So pixels are aerial elements, they're, air, they're two dimensional elements. In a CT scanner we have voxels, there are three dimensional elements and each of them contain a value which is tied to the attenuation, in other words, the density of the material that's inside of it. And based on that information we can detect what's in it and the movement of different fluids and how the interaction happens. So for instance, there's a series of images here. We have uh, stuff here that's not as dense and as you move to uh, the right, water starts invading, water's denser than what's in there in the, at the beginning, and so you start seeing it becoming a little more, a little darker. And the difference between the voxel values allows us to infer what the content of each voxel is at every given point in time. So I did some, uh, some work to establish flow behavior in, the, uh, in this setup, and just to give you a few examples, um, the data that's collected, three-dimensional data put together, uh, then a section through the core, and then creating one-dimensional saturation profiles as things move. There are details that you can see in the cross-range three-dimensional images that led us to develop models and uh, kind of develop a better insight as to how things move. When I joined the University of Wyoming, I didn't have, I, I still don't have access to tomography equipment, so I thought, all right, so what I'm going to do is develop a microfluidics lab. I've never done this before, so it was a, took a little bit, a little while to figure out how things work. I was familiar with the literature, however. There are a few examples of work that's been published in the literature. So this set of images here on the top left um, are uh, associated with two-phase flow. There is a resident fluid that's uh, water and there is something else that's being pushed from the top or from the bottom in this case and there is a contrast in how dense the two material are and they're flowing inside a medium that's made up of glass beads and so there is a light source behind this data is captured and there is conclusions drawn based on the behavior how dense matter behaves compa compared to the resident fluid is it a nice displacement front? Is it this fingering type behavior? Um, that sort of, those sort of questions are answered by looking at this data. This is called the Healy Shaw cell. They put two pieces of glass on top of each other and flow different things in the uh, space between them to say something about the evolution of the interface between the two fluids. This is more of a microfluidic device. This one is pretty narrow, six millimeters by about 38 millimeters long. And there are a series of channels present in this microfluidic device. They're all regular shaped. Geometries are not what you'd expect to see in the subsurface. Uh, this is an example of a microfluidic device from roughly 40 years ago. Um, I have it in my lab. Uh, it was done by a faculty who's since retired. And I've kept them. I think it's kind of a history. Uh, just to give you a sense, I have a quarter there. So there are little openings inside this piece of glass, and they're really large. So this is not, in my mind at least, representative of what you'd expect to see inside the subsurface. What things, uh, the, the way this kind of um, 
methodology has evolved throughout the years. Uh, you know, it's gone from the simple cases you just saw to something a little more sophisticated. So here's an example of uh, more recent work where the grains are more representative of what you might expect to see in the subsurface. Typically, uh, the device is placed in a core holder or, or the holder of some sort. The area that's exposed uh, to uh, the camera is divided up into small boxes and the camera that's sitting on a microscope is focused on each of them at a time, take images that are stitched together to say something about the overall medium. This is a zoom, a close-up image of the channels um, in a microfluidic device. So this is more realistic in contrast to this where everything looks like a, like a rectangular kind of a cross section. Or this is a little more representative of the subsurface. But essentially the way it works, there's some kind of a pattern that's etched on glass, and there's a second glass that's a cover plate that's put on top, and somehow they're bonded, and there's an inlet, inlet and an outlet, and this device is placed under a camera of some sort, and um, data is collected. Now, so when I started developing the microfluidics lab, I started kind of trying to push the envelope a little bit. The first thing I thought was to use my sapphire, and that is because it's got excellent mechanical properties, very strong. It has. It is uh, chemically very, very resistant, very stable, and it, uh, it's optically very desirable for imaging type uh, exercises. So what we did, we took uh, Sapphire, um, and in collaboration with a colleague at the University of Wyoming, Dr. John Oki, and through him with Dr. Jeff Squire at the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, down in Colorado, we used their femtosecond laser pulse systems to etch channels inside Sapphire, um, what we noticed was um, the channels that we can etch all look like this. It's like a milling system. It's a laser you focus on the surface and then you move the substrate with respect to a laser source and as you do this a channel is etched on the surface and we have a bit of control over depth and width of these channels. They are micron scale. However, for to make something that's representative of the subsurface, you're talking about the complex network of channels that are variable in geometry, they keep changing in size, and it's ultimately difficult to use the femtosecond laser pulses to make them. The second issue that we came across was that the channels that we were etching on sapphire were not consistent. Their repeatability was kind of under question, and I think the reason might be that sapphire, like I mentioned yesterday, has a crystalline structure. They have a lot of success using femtosecond laser pulse. It's a laser that gets focused on the surface of the substrate. They have a lot of success with it using uh, the system to etch on glass. And that's because glass doesn't have a crystalline structure. The orientation of glass with respect to the source is not a big factor. Sapphire, just a tiny bit of uh, realignment, or if you just change the orientation a tiny bit, just changes, changes the entire behavior. Then we thought about bonding. Um, so let's say we were to etch channels on the surface of sapphire, but we need to bond it. We experiment with different ideas. We experimented with using chemicals, doing chemical bonding, ended up clogging up all the channels that we had etched. We also um, experimented a little bit with the idea of thermal bonding. The issue is to have two pieces of sapphire thermally bond, the temperature needs to be raised close to the melting temperature of the sapphire plate. And sapphire melts over 2,000 degrees Celsius. And that is uh, kind of a high bar to meet. So we decided to use the femtosecond laser pulse, experiment with it to see if we could, if we were to have a little less sharply focused uh, laser pulse uh, pointed at the interface at the the, the plane where the two sapphire plates meet, if it causes the two sapphire plates to bond, and we had success, and that's what this is. And so instead of etching, by changing the focus of the laser, it bonds the two sapphires that are in two plates of sapphire that are in contact. And this is due to the movement of the stage with respect to the laser source. Um, they just move along this path and create a bond. And to test the uh, the seal, we injected uh, ethanol, so there's air and ethanol, and we looked at the movement of the interface to make sure that it doesn't breach the bond, that the bond is actually there and uh, is able to uh, uh, provide a seal. And we also tested its mechanical properties. That's a manuscript we currently have 
uh, you're going to send out for review here soon. The, the next thing I decided to look at was pushing the envelope in terms of scale. Uh, this is work done in collaboration with a colleague at the University of Wyoming a few years ago uh, in Dr. Peary's lab. The postdoc who did this work, his last name is Sarology, he's now a professor in petroleum engineering, but he had access to a focused ion beam system on an SEM machine, and so he used that he bombarded the surface of a glass substrate with the ions which caused um, these channels to be formed and we experimented with the uh, properties, the geometries of these channels, in particular this is the width, as a function of the energy of the beam that was used to create the, cha the channels. We were able to go to sub-micron, about 500, 400, 200 nanometer type scale, but that's the extent of it. And so I, I was interested in seeing how far we could push this scale, maybe go truly to nanoscale, very, very small. I developed a collaboration with Arizona State and uh, through working with them, we talked about different lithography techniques and they have an electron beam system down in Arizona State in the nan nanofabrication shop. And what we ended up doing was using that system to etch channels. So these channels are, uh, this, I, this is the surface of, a, uh, of the substrate and it's pretty flat. What you see here is something called a photoresist, but if that was to be removed, the surface is very flat and the channel that you can etch, they're capable of reaching um, sizes in the vicinity of 10 nanometers, so they can do very small channels. So we ended up making devices, actually one uh, device with quite uh, a, a complex series of uh, nanoscale features, channels. Uh, the, the issue is when you're talking about 20, 30, 40, or 10 nano meter wide channels, it's really difficult to see anything in these small channels. It's so small, optically, there's not much to see. The signal is so small. Um, there are other people elsewhere that do this sort of thing, and as the best, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the way to do this is to, instead of etching one channel, is to etch many, many of them, let's say a thousand of them, and then all of them together produce a large enough signal that's visible. You can collect the information, say something about the behavior over the entirety of the, the bundle of the channels. One is difficult to observe and, and collect information on. So what I decided to do, I learned about nanoscale nanofluidics. I tried sapphire. I learned how that works. I decided to kind of move to glass and develop the technique in-house so we can make them uh, in the lab and address questions that are of interest. And so here's a series of steps that kind of describe that process, which this took us a little while to figure out all the details, and I'll explain some of them here. This is a thin section from a formation down in Mississippi that Department of Energy is spending money on to see if they could do commercial CO2 storage. Uh, I was part of the project, they sent me a sample, I had somebody make a thin section, uh, with epoxy, blue epoxy. Then we took it uh, to an SEM and took 400 SEM images co covering an area of about 4 millimeters by 4 millimeters. So these are uh, SEM images with nanoscale resolution. Each pixel uh, is, is nanoscale in terms of size. But there are 400 of these that cover that little 4 millimeter by 4, four millimeter area. And we developed an algorithm that to each adjacent, each two adjacent images uh, overlapped a little bit so we could figure out how to put them next to each other appropriately. We wrote an algorithm, developed an algorithm, wrote up a code to detect the patterns, common patterns between them so that we could align them perfectly and make an image. So this is the 400 images put together with nano uh, resolution. Each pixel is 500 nanometers in this, in this image. The next uh, step is to capture the throat size distribution that is present in the actual three-dimensional sample. We sent the sample out to uh, get some data on. They did mercury intrusion test, and the outcome of that test is the distribution of the throat sizes. So what I mean by that is, if you look here, there are little openings, these are pores, but the connections aren't there. A lot of the pores aren't connected. And the reason for that is, the connections are in three dimensions in the actual rock. They're not in two dimensions. So here's another example. I borrowed this slide from a presentation uh, that I made back in 2015 in the American Geophysical Union uh, meeting. This is a 
thin section where all the grains are turned into uh, these white blobs and the black areas correspond to the pores. And if you notice, they aren't really connected, but there is connection. There is quite a bit of connections, but the connections are in three dimensions. So what we do is we figure out the distribution of throat sizes, capture this information, connect the pores according to that distribution, which results in a, a map that looks like that. Now to demonstrate what that means, uh, the connections, uh, what I mean by the idea of connections being three dimensions. So this is a sample, a shale sample that uh, was uh, imaged using a FIB-SEM system. They collected over 700 images. Uh, this, the resolution are two and a half to five nanometers. So very, very high resolution images. They created this, it's already published. They published this work. Um, and uh, through a common, a collaborative project, I had the opportunity to work with the data. And with a colleague at Stanford, Dr. Cynthia Ross, we did some work on this. This is a reconstruction of the of the pore spaces, and you can see the idea of these pore spaces is a three-dimensional idea. So if you were to cut a section through the sample, the pores would not be really connected at all much. So to capture the, connect, the connectivity that exists in 3D onto a 2D map, because that's what we need. We're talking about a quasi-two-dimensional medium. It needs to be a 2D <coughs> map. We take that distribution, translate it onto the map, connect the pores, so that uh, we come up with this map right here that then we can uh, translate using a lithography technique onto the surface of a piece of glass. Then looking uh, under a confocal microscope, we characterize the depths, the geometries. Once we're happy with it, we bond it and create a microfluidic device, which is placed under a high resolution camera. In this particular case, it's a 60 megapixel monochromatic back um, so each pixel is about five microns, and we can take an image of the entirety of the porous medium, but there's enough resolution in the images so you can zoom in after the fact, after you've taken the images, and you can see features as, as small as about 10 microns. Uh, the fabrication is uh, an important part. The, and I've tried, I'll try to describe how the fabrication works. This is something that uh, you know, it, it was a learning curve for me personally. You need some kind of a UV system, that's where things start. I uh, tried to buy one of these, it turned out that it's not a cheap piece of equipment, so we ended up making it ourselves. This is our concoction, we made this in the lab. Uh, there is a piece of glass, this is boro float glass. On top of which, there is a very thin layer of chrome, and on top of that, there is a thin layer of photoresist. Then we take this mask that we created, we put this on top, right there, and on top of this we usually put another piece of glass. Then we put this under the photoresist, the, the UV system, that um, there is a series of lenses that isolate and collimate 365 nanometer wavelength in the UV spectrum, and shines it on this sandwiched layer of photoresist. The photoresist reacts to the presence of the UV, and this becomes kind of like the old photography, if you remember. There's, you would take a picture, and they'd have to go in a dark room and put in some kind of chemical, and that's exactly what this is. We put this in a chemical. The parts on the photoresist that are exposed to the UV light then can react with the chemical, and then they disappear, essentially. They get dissolved, they go away. And then we put in another chemical that eats up the chrome layer, so that pattern gets transferred onto the chrome. Then we put in another chemical that's, uh, uh, that eats up glass, and that pattern gets transferred to the glass. Then we get rid of the photoresist and the chrome, and all we have is the piece of glass with the pattern on top of it. Then we take a blank substrate, we drill holes where we need them to be, and then we take this, rotate it, put it on top, and then thermally bonded. We raise the temperature to about the melting temperature of the glass, which is about 660 degrees Celsius. Through a protocol, stays there for a while, and they fuse. So here are some pictures of that process, where this is placed under a UV light. Uh, the pattern is transferred onto the photoresist, onto the chrome, and finally, the bonding happens, and it goes under the camera. Now, the camera itself is connected to pumps, uh, there's the data acquisition system on top, 
So different fluids go in, they come out, the capture images say something about how things move in the subsurface. Now the camera itself, um, like I mentioned, it's a high resolution, it's monochromatic, um, and I talked about this a little bit yesterday. Um, there are different types of sensors. There is something called a CMOS, which is relatively cheap to make, low energy requirements. They put them in camera and phones. Uh, there are a lot more expensive uh, and um, more power hungry systems, which is the one we have in this camera. It's called a CCD uh, sensor. And each pixel occupies a certain amount. So if you have, we have 60 mega, 60 million pixels. So there's 60 million of these little squares on the sensor. And usually they put a, some kind of a filter on top if you want a color picture. But uh, when you put a color, a, a kind of a filter on top of it, each pixel gets exposed to one particular uh, color. So if you have red, the, the filter only allows red to go through for this particular pixel. This pixel only detects how much red there is. And then for the final image, the software, what it does, it surveys the, the surrounding pixels to figure out how much blue there is and how much um, green there is. So the other two colors is not based on that pixel, it's based on the surrounding pixels. So in essence, the resolution of a color camera is going to be less than the number of actual pixels you have on the sensor because there's, a vol there's an aerial averaging going on to construct, to reconstruct the color at that location based on information not from that location, from the surrounding locations. So in this case, we don't have that filter on top. It's monochromatic, just grayscale. So that if it says 60, mega, 60 megapixels, that becomes the actual resolution. We're not doing this aerial averaging. Um, this is what the lab looks like. Um, there's a camera that sits on top of a light source. The devices go in there, series of pumps that put stuff in there. Um, the, uh, the computer system that runs it. And you can see other things in the background. Uh, different types of holders, sometimes we glue on connections, sometimes we use uh, some kind of a holder that sits underneath the camera. This is an early example of our design uh, of the microfluidic device that's placed under the camera. This is what the picture looks like and the benefit of the idea that I mentioned um, of having high resolution capability is even though you can see the entire medium, you are able to zoom in after the fact and see small details. This is in contrast to what it is typically done, where to see the entirety of the medium is really hard to do, but they put it under a microscope and they zoom in into an area, take a picture of this. If they want to see what's going on over here, they have to take a picture of that. So they are taking a whole bunch of pictures and stitching them together to see the entirety of the thing. Uh, the problem is if there's some kind of process, it's a dynamic process, well, this picture is going to happen at a different time point in time than the picture next to it, and that's going to be at a different point in time than the picture next to it, and that's going to be very different than the picture over here. So when you stitch them together, so that the image that, that is reconstructed does not represent a singular point in time. It's a mishmash of different points in time. With this idea, you take an image of the whole thing, you have enough resolution to see enough details after the fact. <coughs> Um, if we need to zoom in further, we can put them under a camera system that's sitting on top of a microscope, and that's what that is. That's if you're not interested in seeing a large area, we have a particular geometry we want to focus on. And sometimes we use other types of uh, hold the holders to facilitate this. Here's an example of images captured under the, under the microscope system. So in this case, the uh, researcher is interested in seeing uh, there's water coming in from these two sites, and it goes out this way, and there's oil coming in this way, so it uh, snaps off little bubbles, and the question is, well, as a function of the properties of the interface, the size of the bubble changes, the properties change, and this particular person is interested in uh, characterizing the interface as a, as a function of different variables. Okay, so we use this capability to uh, answer, ask and answer different questions. Uh, and there are a few examples. One is trying to understand the interface, how interface evolves as a function of the properties of the fluids. If you're pushing something into the medium that's relatively uh, denser and more viscous than what's in there, 
the displacement front is relatively sharp and nice. Otherwise, there are instabilities that develop over time and they can become really severe and they cause a significant amount, potentially significant amounts of bypass fluid. So if you're trying to push oil out, you'd like it to look like this, not like this. Or in CO2 storage, if you're trying to push brine out and replace it with supercritical CO2, uh, then we'd like it to look like this and not like that. Um, but if we also think about ways to push the flow regime, the flow behavior from something that looks more like this to more stable, and one way to do that is to, uh, with CO2 in particular, is to use CO2 foam. And that's something that we've looked at in heterogeneous systems and, uh, and in homogeneous system where we inject foam and uh, try to characterize the behavior. Now, the, the flow behavior is an important idea for subsurface applications and can vary significantly as a function of the properties. So if it's a really stable front, it looks something like this, and then moving from the bottom left corner to the upper right-hand corner becomes more unstable. And uh, stability happens along two different dimensions in this case. Um, and as you go to the right, and you'll see that there's significant amounts of the resonant fluid that just gets left behind. So this is what's going in, and all this stuff is getting bypassed. Here, all this stuff is getting bypassed. It's just a little finger that shoots through. But here, you get a really nice displacement front, and the idea is to push the flow behavior over to something that looks more like that. One way in CO2 applications, which is an important idea here in the state of Wyoming because uh, it's a very effective enhanced oil recovery method, and if uh, there's concerns around uh, its uh, use, and then what, what do you do with it after you're done with it? You could leave it on the ground, that becomes CO2 utilization and storage. Or in saline aquifers or old depleted uh, petroleum reservoirs, you could, if you have a point source and are able to sequester the CO2 from the stack of a power plant, that could be shipped over to the acid and then piped into the subsurface and just kept there so that it doesn't get into the atmosphere and contribute to global climate change. However, uh, CO2 is really mobile, so an, an idea to go from the upper corner to this more stable behavior is instead of injecting CO2, if we inject a series of things, water, uh, brine, uh, surfactants, along with the CO2 to create foam. So this is similar to one when you wash your hand, if you use soap, due to the shearing that's caused by you rubbing your hands together, that shearing causes foam to appear. And the, the reason why they appear and they stay in the foam phase is the presence of surfactants, the soap. If soap isn't there, you might be able to, you know, do this kind of movement and create a couple bubbles, but they don't live very long. Uh, this idea in the subsurface application is similar. It's the idea of using surfactants and uh, creating uh, stable foams. Now, the issue is surfactants, usually there are long chains that either like the water phase or the gas phase, and there is an end that is kind of ambivalent, and that goes in the interface, um, or it might like the other phase, so this long chain can like one phase, and one end of this long chain might like the other end, so they go at the interface, at the interface, the shell of that bubble, they go at the interface, and they reinforce it so it doesn't burst, it stays in that form. And that reinforcement is caused by the presence of these surfactants at the interface. The problem is this end that's sitting at the interface is very, very small. We're talking about atoms. Um, however, um, if we could find a way to make them significantly bigger, more stable in the sense of their absorption onto the interface, then we'd have a much improved foam system. And that's what we try to do via the use of uh, nanoparticles. Nanoparticles can, and these red, these little yellow circles, you might think of them as nanoparticles, the surfactants can get absorbed on the surface of the nanoparticles, and instead of these little blue blobs becoming the part of the surfactant that gets absorbed onto the interface, then it's a nanoparticle that's staying at the interface, and that's significantly larger, orders of magnitude larger, and it's a lot more stable system. What it does is it introduces um, it improves the properties, the viscoelasticity of the interface. So if this, if I were to imagine somehow magically, if I were to put my hands around this and then pull this, the question is how much do I need to pull before this ruptures and this becomes a bubble? The more it takes for me to pull, the more elastic, the more resilient the surface is, this interface, and the more resilient it is, 
the better the behavior of the system is going to be in the subsurface. The reason is in the subsurface we have pores that keep changing in size, and if you have a blob, the blob might need to get pushed through a small throat and then goes out into the pore and get pushed through another small throat and goes through the pore again. And if it's resilient, it can do that. If it's not resilient, it might rupture and then there might form a bubble in the middle of the pore that then whatever you're pushing just goes around and just stays there, it becomes trapped. So creating a physical connectivity, a, a, a continuity, and whatever that, that fluid is that we're trying to push out, this idea helps that. Now, this is work done by a former student, now Dr. Guo, um, Kevin, and uh, he looked at uh, silica nanoparticles, nanoclays, and then he also looked at iron oxide nanoparticles for this process. Iron oxide, it's, uh, we're talking about nanoparticles around the 50 nanometer in diameter. And they are paramagnetic, meaning if they're exposed to a magnetic field, they respond, and that property can be used for different purposes. And we also, he also looked at fly ash, which is a byproduct of cool power plants, and we thought we could use the waste stream of the power plant for something productive. Um, so what we found is that for the iron oxide nanoparticles, with our simple benchtop magnets, we removed 76% of the nanoparticles. And for field application, it would be interesting to explore how we could remove more of it. So instead of having to bring in more of this material to the site, you recycle significant amounts. Uh, and um, that also helps with the economics and the environmental footprint of this work. And uh, we show that it does impact the, the ability to recover what's in the ground. Um, these curves show how much of what was in the ground, this curve was oil in the microfluidic chip, how much of it was recovered via the use of nanoparticles. Which, these are significant um, in the 60-80% range. The x-axis is pore volume injected. In practice, this doesn't go above one or two. Um, but even if in practice, for field scale, doesn't go above one or two, but if you were to take, put your finger in a particular position in a field, and then ask the question, how many pore volumes do you see? Well, it depends on where it is. If it's near a well, it's gonna be really, really large. Um, but this kind of represents the behavior you might expect in the subsurface. We also looked at the CO2 storage application. And for the CO2 storage, we uh, put the brine, we reconstituted the brine that is present in the uh, deep aquifer, um, and uh, that was that became the resident fluid. We pushed CO2 to displace the resident fluid, and in this case, the displacement efficiency, and this is under ideal conditions, was, was very large, but um, and in practice, it would not be this much at all. However, if we were to put CO2 in, then all, all of a sudden, there would be a significant increase in our ability to displace the resident fluid. So compare this, how, how much the the more the blacker this part is, the better it is in terms of having, able, having been able to displace the resident fluid. And how dark this is, we are able to displace quite a bit of the resident fluid there. So there are a lot of uh, applications that we could think about. The next idea is the use of the microfluidic platform to think about heterogeneity. This is a picture I took at the Alcova Reservoir. This is an aeolian <coughs> sandstone that is the source for significant uh, production of oil and gas in the state of Wyoming. And this particular location is exposed, but uh, not too far away from this particular geographical location. That same formation is responsible for significant production of oil and gas. Now, if you notice, there's significant uh, complexity. And if you were to kind of imagine yourself in the middle of this rock, moving up, uh, you would experience different environments very quickly. There's a lot of variability. So it's not a homogeneous medium. Uh, so what we did was we made a microfluidic device that has a tight area in the middle and two areas that are much more permeable in an attempt to think about the impact of heterogeneity. What happens when you have a tight area and a couple areas around it that are not tight? What happens to the behavior? What's, what kind of behavior can we expect? Well, if we have some kind of fluid in there, in this case it was petroleum, but uh, oil, uh, some kind of fluid in there, we're trying to push it out with something else, displace it with CO2 or whatever the case may be. Everything that's going in, for the most part, goes into the, to the large, the high permeability area, the stuff that's got really large pores. The middle area that has small pores doesn't really see much action. 
And the reason is that there are two highways sitting on each side, and this is a little bitty unpaved road, so nobody likes to travel on this small unpaved road. Everybody goes on the highway. However, if we were to find a way to make the, the fluid that's injected into the medium become more viscous, and re, which would require a lot more force, more pressure for it to move through, that would then make the middle road, this unpaved road, it would make it attractive all of a sudden. Because the, it, it's, it's similar to having a significant amount of traffic on the highway. If there's a lot of traffic, you're stuck in the, in the traffic, you might think, all right, now, that unpaved road might not be a bad idea. And so what that causes uh, the, the more viscous fluid to also invade the metal part. And this kind of showcases the idea of using these nanoparticle systems, based systems to uh, strengthen these foams for uh, injection in the subsurface. And what happens is when foam is formed, these little bubbles, when they're stable, the more stable and the more uh, um, effective they are, you get smaller bubbles that last for a long time, and that pushes uh, the, the ejectant to go inside the area that normally wouldn't see any action, as you see here. And ultimately, uh, like I mentioned yesterday, I am also interested in math modeling. The idea is to capture the learnings and then bring them over and, and have them reflect uh, our mathematical understanding of the mathematical descriptions so that we are able to predict. And if we understand a system, that's great, but for large systems, we need to be able to predict and design these systems. Where do we, um, you know, the, the, the surface facilities, what do they look like? What does the development plan look like? We need to have an understanding of how the systems behave. These are uh, numerical results, this one-dimensional solutions that are based on two-dimensional simulation runs using high-resolution numerical simulators that are, these are uh, research-grade simulators. Um, and they're comparing, these, these figures compared these black numerical solutions to the red data coming from uh, tomography-based experiments. And they don't agree. They don't agree. They don't agree. This one is all right, but uh, in general, there's not an, uh, an agreement. What this means is if you expect what you're putting into the ground to show up at the producer a year from now, which is what that's the leading edge of what you're putting into the ground, in reality, you might get it come out of the ground in six months. And so if you're talking about a CO2 storage application or an in-household recovery using CO2, it might mean instead of investing in compression in a year, which was your original plan, all of a sudden you're going to have to do it in three months or in six months. And so that has significant impact on the economics of these, of these projects. So what I try to do with my, uh, with my group and uh, colleagues is to capture what we learn into mathematical formulation. This is a particular formulation of how to think about flow, the conservation of momentum, uh, where we do some sort of upscaling and uh, modify and do a novel formulation for the conservation of momentum that produces predictive models. So now we are able to do a much better job of capturing the experiments. Uh, there is still some variability, but I, I would argue that the variability is to do subscale behavior that cannot be captured using these models in the first place. Um, so with that, uh, uh, I'll just say that this is work uh, as part of uh, Center for Mechanistic Control of Water, Hydrocarbon, Rock Interactions in Unconventional Tight Oath Formations. Um, and just to bring it back to the original idea of scales, I mentioned this yesterday as well. What I'm working on as in the context of this center, I'm a co-PI on the center, and there, there, there's a group of us, I think there are 14 of us. It's led by Professor Tony Kovchek from Stanford at the University of Wyoming. It's myself, uh, Dr. Alvarado, the head of chemical engineering, and Teresa Lehm, Dr. Teresa Lehman from chemistry, USC, Stanford Chinese. Linear Accelerator Center. Chinese and uh, University of Illinois. My focus now as part of this center is to think about scale. So if you have a subsurface process, a system that has uh, physics at nanoscale and physics at kilometer scale, that's 12 orders of magnitude difference. To think about how to describe the system that on, such that our description honors all the relevant physics, from the smallest scales all the way to the larger scales. How, how do we capture that? Is this similar to that military kind of uh, analog where you grab some important statistics from the very small scale? Say something about 
the average or the mean and the standard deviation of some property and bring that up the ladder of skills. That's my thinking at the moment. And so that's what I work on as part of the center. Um, and what I showed you here today is uh, a, a, a sum of lots of different people's work and contributions, people I've worked with and I learned quite a bit from. Um, some of them are previous students, some of them are current students and uh, colleagues in various places. Thank you for your attention. I had two questions. Sure. That you went to the next slide and both times my, answer, my question was answered. Okay. <laughs> so patience is a virtue. All right. <laughs> Absolutely. Any other questions, Bob? No. So when you create the foam, are you creating that before you inject it? Into um, your we've we've tried. Samples? So in, in, in real practice, uh, what I think would happen is in the subsurface, there's water. It's in petroleum system, there's water, or, or saline aquifer. Um, what you'd have to introduce to the system is the nanoparticle surfactant mixture. So then you might create this mixture and then you might inject it into the subsurface. Then you switch the injection to CO2. So now you're only injecting CO2. But when the CO2 goes in, it, 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 it encounters this brine, surfactant, nanoparticle, whatever the case may be, mixture. And then as it tries to go through these small pores, that's the shearing. And that creates the foam, so it becomes bubbles, and then, then, then all of a sudden you get on the surface, you see a built-up impression, because foam is building, and then, then you have to kind of very slowly all of a sudden push. So what happens is the throughput goes down, but it's a nice, relatively clean displacement front going through. In, uh, in laboratory environment, what we've experimented with all sorts of ways to create them. The first idea was what I just explained. I thought, let's just do it the way we would do it in the field. Well, it doesn't work because your medium is so small. By the time you create the foam, it's coming out. There's nothing to see. So first we said, all right, how about we create a porous medium that sits be before the porous medium of interest. So we run this stuff through this porous medium, create the foam, and then push the foam to the second porous medium, which we are observing. We did that, and then we thought, all right, now, now what we do is we have a, a pack of glass beads. It's literally this big around. There's a small cylinder, and it's sitting somewhere in the line. And from the top, gas is coming in. From the bottom, the surfactant solution brine mixture is coming in. So they two come in, and they go through the glass beads at the same time. As they go through the glass beads, foam is created. The outlet of the glass bead pack then is just foam, and then the foam goes into the pore And that's how we do it now. So what are the typical pressures you have to inject, or that gets encountered once the foam starts to create? Um, it depends on, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of user defined. Uh, you know, you could run the system under 100 PSI if the, we're talking about, so the, the pressure from the inlet to the outlet is the force required to push the fluids through the medium. So you're talking about a big medium, it takes more force. If you want to push stuff through it faster, it takes more force. We're talking about a small medium, and so we could use 100 PSI to move stuff through. Um, if you want to move them faster, the pressure goes up. We can specify the pressure or the rate. Um, but if you're interested in supercritical conditions, which is the typical case in the subsurface, not all CO2 injection projects are supercritical. Most of them are, uh, with a couple exceptions. Uh, I think most of them are. So it'd be interesting to look at supercritical CO2 in the subsurface. So what, when we do that, then we put a uh, pressure regulator downstream of the porous medium which doesn't allow anything to go through until you have reached the pressure of whatever it is, 1200 PSI. So the inlet keeps pushing and pushing, nothing happens, keeps, and then until it goes beyond the 1200 threshold. So you might have 1400 here and 1200 here, and you have 200 across the medium. Uh, but the average pressure, we control that depending on what we're interested in. Okay. And then could I ask you to go back to one of your slides? Sure. You had a slide that was the, the gray medium, and then you had a zoom in that was outlined in a red border. Yes. Okay, what is the material? This is, uh, this is uh, glass. Uh, these are, so imagine that 
these channels are etched, so there are channels on the glass. Okay. There's a piece of glass, we etch this pattern on the glass, so these blobs are not etched. These are the original surface. These black areas are etched. Okay. They're, they're, they're indentations, they're, they're channels. And then we take a blank one and put it on top, right. and then bond, so now all of a sudden, these channels are isolated in the middle and in inside of the medium of this glass, and there's an inlet and an outlet, and there's a distribution network here, so you get whatever you put in gets distributed, you get uniform pressure across the face, inject, and it comes out. Okay. Am I seeing a repeat in the edge pattern across the face of the glass? Because it looks to me like I'm seeing the same pattern over and over, um, from there left to right. It looks like I. It looks like I see one, two, three, four, five yeah. Yeah. repeats. That's a, a that's a good observation. The answer is yes. Okay. So what we do is we take a representation of. Um, so the way this is. So if you remember. When we we're talking about how we make these masks, so this is a this is a this is about that big around. Um, we take it to an SEM. We have to select an area on this thing uh, where we can take really high resolution images. And so what we end up doing is there's artwork involved here, right? And so so we just look around, look around, look around, look around, and then say. I think that's a good spot. It kind of represents what, what what it looks like overall. It kind of captures it. It doesn't have that variability that you like see over here. That's crazy. I don't you don't see it anywhere else. You just see it here. Everywhere else looks nice, but there's that. There's a, that, that's a good spot. Agree, and once everybody agrees, right. we say all right, that's your it. And then we take that area under SCM. We take a bunch of images, and then once we have taken the images, then we stitch them together. It becomes this. Then we take this information, we create the connectivity. Once we have the connectivity, then this, we want to create um, a mask that covers, uh, that covers, this is one millimeter. So this right. is what, four millimeters. And so we want to cover an area that might be four centimeters, five centimeters. We're making now ones that are nine centimeters. And so uh, we take that pattern that we just created that's small, and then we work out the edges such that if you just take it, copy and paste it, then everything lines up and should boom, 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 cover the whole place. Okay. And one more question. I don't know what the temperatures are at the region subsurface that you would be injecting into. So do you do your experiments at comparable temperatures or are your all room temperature experiments? We do both. We do both. We have control over the temperature. Um, Sometimes when we think temperature isn't a factor, based on our experience and published work, we say, temperature doesn't make a big difference here. Um, let's just do room temperature so we don't have to worry about it. But sometimes we worry about temperature. So nanoparticle foam systems, they are sensitive to temperature. Um, and over 100 degrees Celsius or 90, uh, about 100 degrees, they start breaking down a lot faster. Um, so that's something we try to establish. And if we decide that we want to do it at the temperature of interest, we have heaters, heating coils attached to the lines, and there's a um, um, there's a device someplace in the lab that uh, that we use to accomplish that task. I don't know if it shows up in the picture, but uh, how about pressure, Simon? Pressure. You know, we talk about reservoir pressures, uh, you know, kilometers in depth. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's hard to see. There's a chiller back here, okay. and this guy can close. So, do you see this line? Mm -hmm. These lines are controlling the temperature of, of that. See, their lines are connected to this, come temperature of this. And here's the tapes that go around the lines, control temperatures there. And this also controls the temperature. This is a surfactant mixture. This is a device here that separates the surfactant mixture from the water that comes from the pump. So we control the temperature. The pressure uh, for this, not for these uh, devices, um, this device right here, um, it went up to 1,400, 1,500 PSI. Uh, they usually break if you push them too far. And the way to make them not break is to put them in a secondary containment yeah. and put liquid around it and pressurize that liquid. Um, the, the reason why we didn't do that is 
for um, the imaging, it just life is a lot easier this way. The quality of the images are better. Um, but if you want to go, if you, if you need to go to high pressures, we can't do it with this setup. We, we might be able to push it like to 2,000 or something. But um, do you have a sense of uh, how much difference uh, the reservoir types of pressures might make? Um, I guess really with the surfactant, is, well, with the um, uh, the foam that you're you know, you're using. I, it seems like um, pressure. Um, reduces the stability a little bit, uh, something to consider. Um, under the pressures of interest that we've been looking at, um, we've gone all the way to supercritical, and this is work that's being done right now in the lab. Um, and we're trying to figure out how to fine tune some of these uh, the parameters. I think it makes a significant difference. Temperature does also. Um, the remedy is to find the surfactants and the nanoparticles the mixtures such that it's able to withstand. So it's 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 a it's an engineering exercise to figure out the sizes, the material, the surfactants, the densities, um, the concentrations um, to, to try to figure this out. I, I haven't we have had success up until about a thousand psi. So they don't seem to be bothered too much. They seem to function just fine. Beyond that, we haven't um, looked into it too much. I also have a core flooding system that's not in the field of view here, it's over here, but uh, with that we could go up to 5,000 PSI if we need to, which is something I haven't done for the form system. Yes, ma'am. Okay, when you, <clears throat> excuse me, when you have your sandwiches together and you are etching your um, different layers mm -hmm. and you get down through the first few layers, how, how do you etch that third layer into the glass without just totally removing everything yeah. a, as you go? Is there some way that you protect your, um, your other layers in there where you have done your original etching? Yes. Um, this yes. image, so this guy, once this is exposed to the UV system, um, which gets put here, this gets turned on, the UV comes through here. There's a series of lenses here, up here and here. And what they do is they collimate, they make all the waves straight. Uh -huh. um, they um, take care of the quality of the wave, the waves going through, um, and so they're exposed, the, the, this gets exposed to uh, that mask and the areas of mask that are transparent, the UV light goes through them, through them right? So we have a mask that looks like this. Mm -hmm. This mask sits on top of the chrome, on top of the photoresist, mm -hmm. so it's this, this black layer. And that and then, mask then is one of the, the stitched together pictures of the, the little... Uh, right, it's actually a portraits. physical thing. It's a, it's a, this is printed on a piece of transparency or on a piece of glass. So oh, okay. it's a, like imagine you take a piece of glass and this is on the piece of glass. Got it. Okay. And then you put this on the photoresist on top of here. Mm -hmm. If it's glass, then you don't need the top glass. It's already glass. If it's transparency, you put something so it stays flat. This goes under the UV system, UV goes through, but when it gets to the mask, if the mask is dark, it doesn't go through. If it's light, it goes through. Mm -hmm. So the area is where the mask doesn't have anything printed on it that correspond to the pores, to the openings inside the rock, then the UV goes through those areas. So those parts of the photoresist are the parts that get exposed to the, to the UV light. So once that's done, turn on the UV light, turn off the UV light, take everything apart, then we take the, the photoresist, we dunk it in a developer, and the areas of the photoresist that were exposed to the UV light, they are removed in the, photo, in, in the developer. This is called a positive photoresist. Uh, there's another one where the areas that get exposed are the ones that stay. Mm -hmm. There's a is a positive for the negative is the one is that one. This is positive. The area that get the areas that get exposed are the ones that get removed. So they get removed. Then we put it in another uh, chemical that only reacts to chrome. Doesn't do anything with photoresist. Doesn't do anything to anything else. Only reacts with chrome. And so the areas of the chrome that are exposed because the photoresist is now gone, they get exposed to the chrome etchant, and then that part, that part of the chrome gets removed. Mm -hmm. Now that, that 
part of the chrome is removed, now those parts of the glass are not exposed. So we then, then clean it, then we put in another uh, chemical that only reacts with glass. It doesn't touch the photoresist, it doesn't touch the chrome, it just reacts with glass. So it goes in and then eats the glass. And then we leave it in there for as long as we want to or we need to, to make it deep enough. The, the etching rate is angstroms per minute. It's very, very slow. Not per minute, per second. So if you want to make it, if you want to etch something that's like five angstroms deep, you could do it. It won't be any good because that's too thin to make anything out of it. But So you leave it there for a long time, a day, and then you get channels that are at the depth that you'd like. And then once it's done, once you have this, then we take it and put them into things that eat up the rest of the stuff. So we have chemicals that, uh, that remove everything that's sitting on top of the glass. So then, then we have this glass, we clean it, make sure uh, there's nothing on it. And as I was saying yesterday, this work needs to ideally be done in a clean room. We don't have a clean room, we're doing it in an environment that's much dirtier than this. This is nicer than our lab. Uh, so what ends up happening, because we have the vents blowing really vigorously all the time. So what we end up doing is we uh, use a series of very corrosive chemicals to make sure that these surfaces are super clean and we do some of the work in a, in a uh, glove box. We take a blank one, put it on top. This is the blank one. Then we drill holes, we actually blast holes using alumina particles on the surface wherever we want. So in this configuration we have four of them, just wherever they are, they need to be. And then turn it, put it on top of the one you already etched. And then there is a system we've designed over the past couple of years, we've kind of fine-tuned this. There is an oven, uh, we have, um, it's not steel, it's a, uh, uh, they use it for spaceships. There's, an, there's a particular alloy that's really resistant to temperature. And we have plates made out of it, we have ceramic inside, and we put the sandwiched uh, glass substrates between them, between the ceramics that are sandwiched by this special alloy, it's called Alloy X. And then this whole sandwich setup goes inside the, the furnace, and the temperature goes up following a particular protocol. Goes up, stays, go up, stays. It ends up at 660, depending, 650, 660 degrees Celsius, which is a function of what that material is. Stays there until they fuse, and then comes back down. And once it's done, you open it, then you have a microfluid duration. Can you use them more than once, once you have put fluids in there and taken your pictures? Is it possible to clean them somehow yeah. so that you could do a different concentration yeah. of surfactants? Absolutely. You can clean them. Um, a series, there's cleaning protocols, you know, we can use toluene, acetone, kind of strong solvents, mm -hmm. depending on what was in there in the first place, to try to get everything cleaned out, um, to try to restore the surface properties to what was there originally. We clean them. These are not easy to make. And so we make sure that we can use them over and over again. Microfluidics, there's a kind of, it's a, it's a big area, and a lot of people make them out of something called PDMS, some kind of polymer. And those are easy to make. So in a lot of applications, they make PDMS microfluidic devices. Uh, Dr. Oki in chemical engineering in Wyoming, he has a microfluidics lab. They make it out of PDMS. Um, so they're really, relatively speaking, easy to make. You can make a lot of them every day. This takes three days to make one. Um, they make a ton. They can make a whole bunch of it. They can make a hundred a day easily. Mm -hmm. But then those guys, it's, it's kind of rubber-like. It's, it's flexible. And if you put any kind of pressure, they deform. The material dissolves in some oils. It, it has all sorts of undesirable behavior. But um, it's easy to make. And um, for bio-related work, it's really good. But blood. It wouldn't mimic a reservoir. Right? It wouldn't mimic a reservoir. So, instance, if you're looking at blood, which is, you could, in certain situations, that would also be relevant uh, field to, to think about. But blood reacts with glass. Uh, you kind of create coagulation. But uh, in the presence of PDMS, uh, blood doesn't do anything severe. So, most of the work with blood is done on PDMS or other, other substrates. So, there, there, this is. This is, we're doing it in glass. This is the typical way it works in glass, but um, you don't have to do it in glass. You could use femtosecond laser pulses to etch in glass. The difference is, like I said, it's a laser and you move it around. So if you want a complex network, that's all crazy, crazy geometry is hard to make. Um, you could make them in silicon wafers, and that's the typical way it's done. 
uh, to, but silicon wafers break easily mm -hmm. and uh, so high pressure applications are they're not suitable for high pressure applications mm -hmm. yeah um i'm going to say thank you because you have to drive okay and we've got some other things to do uh, as well but thank you very much so thank you